Whether you have an employment, criminal, family, corporate, or personal injury matter, legal issues can be puzzling. The lawyers at Devery Smith & Frank make all the pieces fit together. Welcome back to Real Estate 101. Today we're going to continue our discussion on family law and talk a little bit about common family law court mistakes. And I'm pleased to be joined once again by John Schumann of Devery Smith Frank LLP. John, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me again. All right, John. So when it comes to separating couples, what is the biggest mistake people make regarding their children? Well, one of the biggest mistakes I see and that people really regret is when you're separating and leaving their kids behind. That is a number of really serious consequences. First of all, there's this thing in, under Ontario law that's called de facto custody. And basically what that means is if you walk away from the house where your kids are, you're basically accepting that the person who stayed behind with the kids has custody. And so that person gets the title of custodial parent just because you left. And that can be a mistake. The other thing it does is it sends a message to a judge that you're not really that interested in the kids because you left them behind. And that can make it harder for you to get back really re-involved in the kid's life. So if you've been an involved parent all your children's life and you want to stay an involved parent, you really can't leave the matrimonial home unless there is a real safety concern. On the flip side, you can't leave the matrimonial home with the kids and take them with you to show how much you love them. I'm going to move out and take the kids with me because that's sort of like kidnapping. Yeah. And the other, if you, the other spouse doesn't know where their kids are, they're going to run to court and there's going to be some nasty orders against you to bring the kids back and maybe give the other parent custody. So you can't run out with the kids either unless there's a real safety concern. And if you're concerned about safety, you need to either talk to a good lawyer about how making a safety plan or to your local police force about putting together a safety plan so you can leave safely. All right, so are those the only mistakes people make when it comes to their children? No, another common mistake that judges view as showing that someone really is not interested in their children is not paying child support immediately upon leaving. So when you're living together, it's a little bit harder to separate what child support is, but if you leave the house and you're living separately, then you should start paying child support in accordance with the guidelines right away. Because the failure to do that sends a message to the judge that you really don't care that much about your children. That's how judges view the failure to pay child support. So. The child support guidelines there, you can look them up online, figuring out what your income is, you can look at your income and you can figure out what the number is for the number of kids you have, you can find that out easily, you can start paying that right away. You may have to pay some other things on top of that for special expenses, but as long as you're paying the base support right away, you're showing that you're really interested in making sure your children are okay after the separation. All right, so is going to family court regarding children a mistake? The answer to that is almost always yes. I talked about safety concerns earlier, and yes, if there are safety concerns, if your spouse is abusive, or if they've got mental health issues, or if they're really unreasonable, or they're you know addicted to drugs or alcohol, and they just can't behave in a rational way, and you really need a hammer of the court to force them to do what they need to do, then court's necessary. Other than that, court is often the worst place to resolve kids' issues. There's a number of reasons for that. One is that, first of all, Judges don't get to see a lot of you and your spouse in court, and sometimes they make decisions about what's, based, what's best for the kids based on only things that your lawyers have said or some things they've read. And that judge may have a completely different view of what your kids are about than what you think your kids are about. So they can have, make it an order that's completely at odds with what, you think is, what both of you think is best for your children. Another problem is that judges don't really like getting into the little itsy bitsy logistics. And sometimes the real details in kids' lives are in the logistics about who takes them to hockey, who takes her to swimming lessons, and how, who, how does dinner work out afterwards. And judges don't get into that. They just set out blocks of time. But you can often have a much better schedule for your kids that keeps them more involved if you and your, your spouse work it out. And there are a number of ways to work that out. You can either sit down and try to work it on your own, or if you can't do that, see a parenting professional, social worker or a psychologist who specializes in developing parenting plans after separation because they can work out the details with you and come up with a plan that works for you and for your kids. And sometimes they even will get your kids input onto what they think should happen. Judges don't really want to do that either because of the trauma of the attacking and viciousness that happens in court. And that viciousness that happens in court, the, the real combativeness and the conflict is really harmful to kids. When they've done the studies about what harms kids, the divorce itself, the separation itself doesn't harm the kids. It's their parents fighting that harms the, the kids. The mental, emotional aspect. That's right. And court sort of breeds that sort of big conflict. Whereas the other alternatives and seeing someone to work it out, that reduces the conflict and usually results in the kids being better off in the long run. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some of the money issues. Um, 
Are there ways to avoid giving your ex a lot of money unnecessarily? Yes, there are. And there's some planning a separation or divorce, even right from the beginning of the marriage, can really help you in terms of protecting your assets and your money in the long run. Because there's some real pitfalls that people fall down into. A, a big one is this, and I'll just the way property is divided is basically you, you share during the, mar uh, the growth in your net worth during your marriage. So it's not what you had, be what everything you share, you share the growth in your net worth during the marriage with a couple exceptions. One of those is that if you get a personal injury settlement or a inheritance, you don't have to share that. And another exception is that- Even if you got that while you were married? Even if you got it while you were married. So that stays out of the calculation, or should stay out of the calculation unless you right. make a mistake. <laughs> the, um, and the other, the other big exception, which is the mistake, is the, um, the matrimonial home when you're married. That always gets divided at its full value, regardless of who paid for it or where the money came from, and even if it's inherited, it gets divided at its full value. That's the place you separate it. You can have more than one. So you can have a house and a cottage. They both get divided at its full value. So if you put that inheritance or that personal injury settlement into your matrimonial home, you'll lose it. If you put that inheritance in or, or personal injury settlement or that sort of money into a joint account or other joint asset, you may lose it. You might get it back if you can trace it, but tracing is a real messy exercise and the courts are sort of wishy-washy about how it's best done, so you can still lose a lot of that money if you put it into a joint asset. And the other thing is if you bring uh, like a house into the marriage and you separate from that house, even though you would otherwise have gotten the credit for bringing it in because you're sharing the growth of your net worth, you don't get a credit for bringing a matrimonial home into the marriage if it's the same house you separated from. So in that case, you'll lose a lot of money. Even if it's a really short marriage, you can lose a lot of money. And the same thing sort of happens with um, other types of assets you, you sort of inherit during the marriage, like uh, a business and things like that, where you get the shares. And if you mix, you get your spouse involved with them, you can get yourself into trouble. So the best way to, um, to avoid that is to either be very careful about what you do with your assets during the marriage and speak to a lawyer about how to protect them or do a marriage contract either before you get married or after you get married to protect those big assets when you know you're going to get them. All right, so what happens if you and your ex aren't married? If you and your ex are not married, then in this, there's no property division under the Family Law Act, which means you don't automatically share in the growth in your net worth. There is still a thing you have to be worried about, and that is that you still have claims under this thing called equity. And what that means is if you tell your, your partner that you know, this is our house, not you know, your house, like it's not my house, it's our house together, or this is um, our business, not my business, even if you put all the money into it yourself, or if you let that person put a lot of money into it, even though it's all in your name, or put a lot of their own effort into it, so you have your, your spouse, you're not married to them, but they, they pay for the renovations to the house, then that person can acquire an interest in equity. And that means they, the court can declare that they own part of the property. So if you are going to have a piece of property, you're not getting married because you don't want to share it in an asset, you want to set yourself up so that you're not having your, other, your partner contribute to that asset significantly and you're not telling them that it's your asset together. Otherwise, you get yourself into some trouble. All right, so you talked about uh, property assets and family assets. Can you lose, for instance, let's say, a family cottage to your ex? Yes, you can. And you can lose your parents' cottage and your, your grandparents' cottage to your, uh, your ex if you're not careful. And the way that happens is this. First of all, if you inherit that property during the marriage, you know, it, it would be excluded except for the fact that you and your spouse spend a lot of time there. So it might become a matrimonial home. And if it's a matrimonial home, then the full value gets shared. So now you have to share half the value of that cottage with your, your ex. So that's, unless you have a marriage contract. So that way you may end up losing the cottage because you have to give half the value to your, your ex-spouse. The other thing that happens with cottages, and this happens whether you're married or not, is that people put a lot of time and effort into them, right? So you have your spouse up there, and you know, your spouse fixes the dock, puts on a deck, you know, redoes the roof, you know, that happens a lot in cottages. People do a lot of do-it-yourself type things at cottages. And if they do a lot of that and, look, and spend a lot of time looking at the cottage, then they can get that same interest I talked about, the equity interest. And so they can make a claim to have an ownership interest in that cottage, even though you inherited it from your parents, who inherited it from their parents, who inherited it from their parents, and it's been your family's cottage for as long back as any can remember, your spouse can get a claim to it. And the only way to really avoid that is at the time you get married, your, uh, you ask for a marriage contract that excludes that cottage from the property division. All right, so let's touch a little bit on spousal support. Um, are there things you can do to 
avoid paying spousal support and maybe reduce the amount that you pay? Well, when you can with property, you can sort of arrange your assets in such a way, like you don't put your inheritance into a joint asset or a matrimonial home. You can't do as much with spousal support. And if you're in a long-term marriage, you're going to, there's a chance you're going to have to pay spousal support. Even short-term marriages, you may have to pay spousal support, but the longer the marriage, the longer the chance of spousal support. And if you have kids, then the, and you're the higher income earner, then chances are you're going to end up paying some spousal support. Because what happens in those marriages is usually the lower income person looks after the kids, yeah. and they're entitled to be compensated for that a little. So getting out of spousal support from trying to uh, uh, manipulate the way things are is almost impossible. If it's a long-term marriage, you're going to be paying spousal support. If you're going to have, if you have kids, you're probably going to be on the hook for spousal support. And the longer and the more kids, the more spousal support. There's other factors that come into it too. It's a really complicated area, but assume that unless you speak to a lawyer and then you can figure out something differently. The only real way to protect yourself from spousal support is through using a marriage contract or a cohabitation agreement. And if you use a marriage contract or a cohabitation agreement, you can set either that there can be no spousal support or you can set that uh, what spousal support will be. So you can say, for instance, that if, if we are married for 10 years and we have three kids, I'm going to pay spousal support of $3,000 a month no matter what else happens. So you can do that in, a, in a, a marriage contract or cohabitation agreement. But short of having that sort of agreement, you're sort of at the mercy of a judge as to what spousal sports can be. And because spousal sports is very complicated and ultimately up to the judge, you may get, end up paying a lot. All right, so are there specific things that people can do that gets them into trouble? Yeah, there's a number of things that really get judges upset in family court. Usually there are things that result someone acting out of emotion. But one thing you have to con uh, consider is that things like text messages, emails, Facebook, LinkedIn, all those sorts of things, if you put it in writing, chances are if you separate, a judge is going to read it. Yeah. Even if you think it's not going to be found or you've erased it, you'd be amazed at how those things somehow make it back in front of judges. And if you really say nasty things about your spouse, then the judge is going to read that and be really angry with you. So if you're going to separate from your spouse, be very, very, very careful about what you say online. Even if you think that it's private, it may not be and may come back to really haunt you. Another thing that gets people into a lot of trouble when they have kids is people think it's okay to tape record their, the spouse with their kids so that maybe they're fighting a lot or, or their discipline is not appropriate. And tape recording or any type of recording of a conversation to which you are not a party is actually a breach of Section 184 of the Criminal Code. You can get arrested for it. And not only, and not only that, but the, any evidence you obtain illegally is not admissible in court, so the court won't look at it. So you go to jail, and what you were trying to do is, doesn't work out because the judge never listens to the tape that you had. So don't go recording conversations unless you've spoken to a lawyer first, and never ever record conversations to which you're not a party. It also gets you into some serious trouble. All right, John, so for today's final question, any last tips on, for people to avoid uh, mistakes in court? Yes, you have to keep a level head in court and act rationally, even if it's really hard because the separation has been really difficult and it's a really emotional time. Because acting out of anger or bitterness or vindictiveness is something that judges really, really hate. And they will come down hard on you and punish you for it. Maybe even take your kids away if you're showing that you can't be a good parent because you're so angry and vindictive. So you have to calm down and act rationally and you can get referred to people who can help you with that. There are divorce coaches and, and therapists. It's all they do is help people deal with the emotional side of their divorce. So you should talk to one of those people. If you don't know one, you, how to find one, speak to a family lawyer. Family lawyers know who these people are and they can get you there. And the second part of that is you should have talk to a family lawyer, at least consult with a family lawyer so you have some idea of what the rules of the game are before you start trying to play them. There are a lot of little pitfalls. I mean, we talked about some of the big ones today that a lot of people fall into, but there's a lot of little ones that can have a big impact that only apply in certain situations. And good family lawyers know them all and they know how to keep you out of them. So make sure you talk to a good family lawyer. If you're thinking about separating or you just separated, just know what path you should be on and how to avoid some really major mistakes that can really hurt you down the road. All right, John, great stuff. I want to thank you for coming on today's show. I'm looking forward to seeing you again uh, sometime next month. Yep, thanks for having me again. So if you're going through a divorce and separation and need the help of a family lawyer, get in contact with John Schumann of Debrie Smith Frank LLP. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.